guys, and welcome back to Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. I'm one of your hosts today. I'm John Kaby, and I'm joined once again by Josh McCuga. What's up, guys? Welcome. Welcome. I am so glad to be back, John. And we are so glad to have you back, and Thanks, we are buddy. so glad that you guys are back as well. This is the show, much more laid back, relaxed, much more informal. We just take your questions that you guys send in to us. Normally, how do you get questions to us? Just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions. Sometimes we answer them on Movie Talk Monday through Friday, sometimes here on the weekend. Take a shot and see if you can get your question on. And without any further ado, we're going to dive right into it. And the first question today comes to us from Dane Lebowski, who writes, <laughs> in response to your comment on Movie Talk earlier, what is the downside to making standalone Spider-Man side character films? If they mishandle them, it could ruin us seeing good iterations of those characters in actual Spider-Man movies. Are we um, talking about Venom here? Is this what we're probably talking at? about? Venom? Venom, Black Cat, and Silver Sable because okay. they announced earlier this right, week right, that right, we right. got Venom coming, Black Cat, Silver Sable, and it looks like we, nobody's given an official word yet. But all the reports coming out of Hollywood Reporter is that they are going to be outside of the MCU. Okay, they're going to be a new cinematic universe, if you will. Uh, no, uh, th these aren't through Sony, or they are it, through they Sony. They are through Sony. Got it. Okay. So it's going to be a new cinematic universe, if the reports are correct. And we don't know 100% that they are, but we're operating on that assumption for now. Um, Trending so, towards a Sony Suicide Squad of sorts? Maybe, if okay. you want, or Got other, it. like, you're, or I'm even speculating, maybe at some point they introduce a Miles Morales Spider-Man. I love it. In, in that. So it. maybe it's, maybe that's happening. But you're saying, you know, if they did it, it would ruin future iterations. I got one word for you. Deadpool. Yeah. Yeah. Deadpool. Look what they did to Deadpool in that Wolverine movie. They mm -hmm. watched it. Did that kill it for any future iteration of Deadpool? Obviously not. It was definitely on life support. Well, because sure. Ryan Reynolds was holding on to that for dear life. And, you know, all it took was was one person to just say, you know what, Ryan, let's effing do this. And they did yep. it and they knocked it out of the park. And that's what you need, I think, for it. Because you know, obviously, Spider-Man 3, we saw Venom of sorts with Topher Grace, a.k.a. Mark Ellis. And, um, <laughs> and it was less than enthused of a performance, I guess you would say. But I thought it was one of the cooler things in Spider-Man 3. But I know a lot of people hated it. Venom has always been my favorite Spider-Man storyline in all of the comic books. Doing a standalone Venom movie gets me super excited. Yeah, I, I look, I think it could be great. The other thing besides Deadpool is take another one. Hulk. Yeah. They, I mean, they. a lot of people did not like that first Ang Lee Hulk movie with Eric Banner nope. playing Banner. So then they moved on to another iteration. And now we've got the Marvel MCU Hulk. And now everybody loves him. So look, three people have played the Hulk, John. Yes, they have. And I personally loved Edward Norton. I know the MCU wasn't a huge fan of his... Uh, Behind the scenes antics, correct. if you will. Yes. Yeah. But we've seen three Hulks. And by all, for all intents and purposes, he is my favorite Avenger. Oh, we, so, oh, yeah. Everybody loves watching yeah. the Hulk doing his thing. Yeah. So, like, so we have a couple of great examples of a character being done, it not getting great response, mm -hmm. and then the, the studio's just going, whatever, let's take another shot at it, and then it works out great. So, I would say, I still firmly believe, like, I know the popular thing, and I never give a flying fuck about what's popular. <laughs> I know the popular thing is to say, no, everything has to be in the MCU. Remember, these are the same people who were saying... Like after like one bad X-Men movie, like whether it's X-Men 3 or whatever, everybody's like, no, all X-Men and everything should go back to Marvel. Well, if that happened, we never would have gotten X-Men Days of Future Past. We never would have gotten the First Deadpool class. movie. We never would have gotten Logan, yeah. like all that kind of stuff. So all I'm saying is, you know what? Take a breath. Remember, Sony is the studio that they, did they give us Spider-Man 3? Yes, they did. Did they give us the amazing Spider-Man 2? Yes, they did. <laughs> but they're also the studio that gave us the first Spider-Man movie. They're also the studio that gave us Spider-Man 2. They're also the studio that gave us the first amazing Spider-Man, which yes. I still contend was a really good movie. It wasn't terrible. They clearly know what they're doing. And like any studio, they've clearly also dropped the ball a few times. I just don't think everything has to be tied in together. I think, look, could this, I said this in Movie Talk, okay. I'll say it again. Could this new universe, if that's what they're doing, with Venom, Black Cat, Silver Sable, and a lot of other Spider-Man, traditional Spider-Man characters, could it be an utter disaster? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, totally could. Just like any movie coming out could be a complete disaster. But so what? If, if it's like the Hulk, they just try it again later. If it's like Deadpool, an iteration of Deadpool, sure. they just try it again later. But what's the potential upside? The potential upside is if they crush it and they do a good job with it, like Spider-Man 1, 2, Amazing Spider-Man 1, if they do a good job with it, now we've got a fourth yep. 
comic book superhero cinematic universe mm -hmm. to give us even more films with characters that quite frankly if they were under the mcu would probably never see the light of day because it's one studio that can only put out so many movies a year <laughs> yes exactly. so i think the upside the potential upside justifies rolling the dice and taking a shot at it and it could fail like any risk it could fail and if it fails oh well we'll move on i mean what's our what's our success rate at this point it's like Seven out of nine, basically, superhero films that come out, we really like. Yeah. So the 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 thought of them failing isn't really in the front of their brains. I feel like <laughs> failure is like 5% back here. All right. Let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Fernando Fernandez, who asked a question yesterday. Yeah, actually, you got one yesterday. Who asked, so I've already been spoiled by seeing how the submarine gets hit by a missile in the trailer for, for <laughs> F8 or Fate of the Furious. <laughs> And seeing the alien crawl into Ryan Reynolds' mouth in the trailer for life. Will there ever be marketing regulations by studios? No. And and there shouldn't be. Because you never know what the twist is. You never know what the twist is. You never know. Okay, all you see is a moment out of context. Mm -hmm. Did that spoil it for you? Look, I, there are some people who have the most ridiculous definition of spoiler. By some people's definitions, there should never be television trailers <laughs> or commercials or anything like that. Nothing, because anything you show me, oh, now that's spoiled. <laughs> we see him eating breakfast. That's spoiling it. I didn't want to know the that. The toothbrush works. That's yes. a spoiler. At some point, I mean, the studios has got to be allowed to look. We need to put a thing together. As audience members, we need to understand that they need to show us something to because they need to get the audience excited about a movie. And you're not going to get ex audiences excited by a movie just saying, this guy and this guy and this guy in this movie opening February 28th. Because if we if they just said Ryan Reynolds, Jake Gyllenhaal in life and didn't show us any pictures, I'd be like, OK, this, yeah. that movie tells you that title tells you absolutely nothing. Yes. I mean, it's it's I Listen, look, you got to show stuff. And remember, it's just understand that you saw a moment. The movies are two hours long. Yes. You just saw a couple of moments that they have to show to market. You, people got to get off this thing. Studio shouldn't show anything. Okay, then no one's going to go to the movies. Right. Well, and also too, listen, you can pick your battles. If you don't want to see trailers two, three, and four on the internet, you don't have to watch Absolutely. them. If you're watching TV and a 30 second trailer comes on, you've already seen it. So it's not ruining much at all. But here's what, I, this is what gets me too. Okay, so coming into this weekend, everybody, and of course, the Justice League tra trailer dropped yesterday. Insider secret. We are actually recording this on Friday, so we have not seen the trailer. Yes. But if you're watching this on Sunday, trailer dropped yesterday, right? For months, months, tons of emails, tweets, Facebook messages, when's the Justice League trailer coming? Yeah. When's the Justice League? And under I'm excited to see it too. We're all, we when's all are. it coming? When's it coming? And then it comes out. They shouldn't have showed all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, you pick a side. You can't have it both. Oh my God, what's the trailer? What's the, what's the, yeah. Oh my God, they show too much. Like you, you can't. I, I, anyway. well, you ordered the meal. When's the meal coming? When's the meal coming? When's the meal coming? I didn't think the steak was going to be that big. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Oh, that's what she said. <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah, I, it's like, it's like we have all this excitement. Jeremy. We want to, okay. Well, then that means you want to see something. Sure. If like everybody's cl clamoring and saying, where are we going to see this trailer? That means you want to see something. So they have to show you something to, to whet the appetite, get, get the audience excited. As <laughs> much as we don't think studio executives and marketing people look at the internet and look at social media, they do. So they, they are going to put things in there that you guys have been wanting. Do we want to see what Aquaman looks like underwater? Of course we did. Like yep. it's, there is a lot of expectations on a first trailer for a movie as anticipated as Justice League because we haven't seen a thing really since Comic-Con. Now, now here's the other thing too. Is there such thing as showing us too much? Sure. Sure there is. A movie called Southpaw. So the whole movie. <laughs> In the trailer. Yeah, pretty much. But here's the thing that I often like tell people to be very cautious of is that sometimes you watch a trailer and you think you just saw everything, mm -hmm. but you you actually haven't seen the movie yet. So you don't know if you've seen everything or not. I've, I've seen a lot of examples of that where people felt like, oh, that thing showed too much. And then they see the movie. like, so oh, actually that, no, the trailers didn't show too much. I'd say just take a breath, realize we're seeing these trailers out of context Every once in a while. Now, then you get like uh, the amazing Spider-Man 2, mm -hmm. which put out like 85 trailers <laughs> and 47 TV spots. Then they had nine villains. And I can't remember the exact number. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, in the comment section. But I believe somebody added it up and they figured out between all the trailers and TV spots, they actually gave like 
40 minutes of footage. <laughs> like, I think this is like the real, look it up, I, fact check it. I'm just pulling this. Uh, there's been a long time since I had to think about this. Then it's like 40 minutes for it. Well, then it's incumbent upon you as the viewer. You make the choice if you want to watch the sure. additional trailers or the additional TV spots. And if you do watch it, well, then that's on you. And then a lot of times in movies, like let's say outside the superhero realm or action realm where you start with a fast date, in a movie like Why Him? I thought the trailer was horrendous. And I really enjoyed the that movie. The movie was great. Right? I, I had such yeah. a good time. I was with like, Why oh, Him. this movie's going to be terrible. I was giggling through the whole thing. So, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes from Tyler Hyde, who writes, what are your thoughts about the Idris about Idris Elba as an actor? Do you think he is underrated or doesn't get enough attention as an actor like me? Can the Dark Tower finally push his stardom up? Um, to me, that's like asking, why is Tom Brady so <laughs> underrated and unrecognized? Listen to the Mike Krzyzewski podcast. I know that's a very thing out there. Bill Belichick does an incredible interview about Tom Brady, right, in that podcast. And it really equates to life in general is Tom Brady doesn't make big mistakes. Idris Elba, same kind of actor. Rarely <laughs> is he in a movie where he doesn't put on an amazing performance mm -hmm. or the movie isn't at least semi-successful. Do you remember him in The Office? Yeah. As incredible. Charles? He was so yes. good. At, but this is the thing. I feel like... I don't think a week goes by in movie talk where we, that Idris Elba isn't brought up. Correct. I hear, hear people talking about James Bond. What does everybody say? Idris, Idris. Elba. Underrated? Yes. Not, I think Idris Elba is one of the, the most talked about he is names rated. in the he industry. Is, yes. And he's not overrated. He's rated perfectly. I love, I never thought that I would love Luther as much as I love mm. Luther. Uh, DCI John Luther, played by Idris Elba, is one of the best TV series made in the last 10 years. And it's up cop drama and we i know that people love csis and they love law and orders and they love these kind of procedurals but if you want to watch perfect uh police officer drama luther check it out check it out it is a very very good show mm -hmm. all right let's move on to the next question uh power rangers pacific rim ghost in the shell do you think that there may be a possibility for a robotech movie since they were recently purchased by sony well, I know that Ken Knapsack loves Robotech. Robotech. Yep. And listen, if Sony bought it, they got plans for it. And I personally would love to see a Robotech movie. And the, the reality is, I remember doing a story on the movie blog. Mm -hmm. This is going back eight or nine years. Jeez. Of new rights and new screenwriter brought on for Robotech. Mm -hmm. Then I believe, uh, who was the first, who played the first Spider-Man? Um, uh, 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 Toby, Toby McGuire. McGuire. <laughs> My that, best friend. Like, Toby McGuire was coming, went on, like joined a Robotech as a producer. Sure. And was and th there have been so many stories over the years about a Robotech movie getting made and it's never come to fruition. Same as a live action Thundercats. That has been in that talks has come forever. And gone, a brand new Jesus. Masters of the Universe. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, He-Man. Uh, like, so there are a lot of projects that have been off and on so much and Robotech is definitely one of those because after the success of the first Transformers movie, I know. that's when people really started talking Robotech. My brother texted me, Robotech would make a great movie. I'm like, I know this. Yeah. We all know this. So, I mean, there's been a lot of talk. There continues to be a lot of talk. I got to believe at some point it's going to, to happen mm -hmm. at some point. Right now, I if you'd asked me nine years ago, though, I would have said, yeah, within the next two or three years, we're going to get mm -hmm. a Robotech movie. If you asked me in 2006, I would say, yeah, within the next few years. I, I just can't even guess at this point because it's been off and on so many times. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Jake Cleveland writes, Phil, oh, it's a poker question. Phil Helmuth versus Doyle Brunson. Heads up, who wins? Phil Helmuth. Doyle Brunson. Really? Think, yeah. Phil, Phil is one of the greatest, maybe, maybe the greatest poker player of all time. Yeah, I love Phil. Uh, but I've watched Doyle Brunson play more heads up than Phil Helmuth, okay. and Phil Helmuth is not great heads up. Okay. He's, I, he's I trust not, your poker knowledge well over mine. I mean, I, I love Mia Doyle Brunson, but maybe Doyle Brunson 20 years ago. And I think Doyle, I think he excels at heads up. Yes. So I, I would personally, I would say Doyle. Let's go win. real quick. Do, who plays the best Doyle Brunson in a biopic? I'm saying Sam Elliott. Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to go, you need a little bit of makeup. Uh, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Ooh, not bad. I Vincent like that. Okay. that. All right. Let's move on to the next question, which comes from Josh DePeel, who writes, do you think we will ever see a real Steel sequel? <laughs> oh my God, I hope so. Look, that's a, that's one of those movies. Real Steel with Hugh Jackman is one of those movies. And uh, a girl from Lost. Very and, underrated. And, 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 and uh, Ant-Man. Um, uh, 
Evangeline Lilly. A good Canadian girl. Yes. I'm embarrassed yes. I forgot her name. Um, one of those movies that we all giggled at. It's Silly. Like, it's Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Yeah. Come on. So good. I had tears at the end of that movie. I, I'll be honest. I loved that movie. That movie is so great. You know who did the fight choreography for it? Who? Sugar Ray Leonard. Get the hell out yeah, of here. I, I, actually, I actually got to interview Sugar Ray Leonard. No. For this movie? For, for, for Real, Real Steel? Steel. Wow. I got to go in and sit down with Sugar Ray. God, and I got to talk to him about it. I'm actually getting goosebumps yeah, thinking yeah. about it. Um, and it was awesome because all we did, we, we started talking about MMA. and so oh, had, yeah. He's a huge MMA fan now. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Real Steel. If you haven't seen Real Steel with Hugh Jackman, I know it looks ridiculous. It's It's got emotion. It's got great character development. Family. And it's got an awesome Rocky kind of There's ending a heart, to it. a real heart to oh. that movie. And it's about robots. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of robots, but man, that movie was so good. Uh, but if we haven't seen a real, it's, it's one of those movies that easily could have had a sequel. Sure. Especially when you see the ending to it. But it's also one of those movies that if they were going to do a sequel, should have done it. It would have happened three years ago. If uh, anything, I feel like this will maybe be a movie in 15, 20 years they remake. Yeah, yeah. You could remake this movie, mm -hmm. sure, uh, in 10 years, whatever. Sure. But I, unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to see a real Agreed. steal. And I think that's a real shame. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jonathan Haley writes, are movie budgets set in stone at the beginning of production or do studios uh, that like what they see ever adjust the budgets to help the filmmaker better realize their visions? Uh, I will say this. I know a lot of personal stories from friends that are either producers or assistants to producers. I had a buddy that was actually Scott Rudin's first assistant. And really? Yeah. And he's got some stories that are unbelievable that I could never tell on camera. But he has some amazing stories from some Scott Rudin movies where Scott sees the dailies and he goes, all right, I'm going to take a bunch of money out of my pocket because I think this movie deserves a little bit more. And then he, then he'll see some dailies from something and be like, you're going to owe me some money on this one. So there, <laughs> I, I, when, when it all, those dailies, people talk about those dailies and how difficult being a director of a movie is and a producer of a movie. Cause those dailies dictate a lot of things. Maybe something like a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. That movie's pretty. That budget is pretty much set until you get to reshoots, and they'll probably throw like 10, 15 more million at you. But they maybe. usually plan for that in advance, Correct. too. Yeah. And and doing if your if your budget's at two hundred million and you can't get it done in two hundred million, hey Stanley Kubrick, there's a reason you didn't get your Napoleon movie made. So. Yeah. Uh, look, it, it's one of these things too. It's not just that they budget whatever. Remember when these the movie business is a business. So when the Studios greenlight a project. They've already put tons of research into how much money do we think this movie can make. Yes. And then they budget it appropriately. Like you come to them with a, a great idea for a movie for $150 million, mm -hmm. but the studio determines, you know, we've done a lot of market research. We have experts and all that kind of stuff. And we crunch numbers and we only think this movie can make like $60 million in theaters. Mm -hmm. So no, we're not going to give you $150 million right. to, to make that movie. All right. So they, they, they'll go, okay, we think this movie has a potential to do this from our market research to make this much money. If it's good, it'll make this much. If it's bad, it'll make this much. So we will budget appropriately to make sure we have those margins that we think we can make a profit on this movie and we'll make, let the budget be this. And then I think eight times out of 10, that number becomes rock solid. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you cannot have more money to finish it. And if you do need, like if it gets down to, we've already invested 60, if we don't invest another 20, the movie's not going to get made and finished, then the studio will probably kick in the number 20 and then you'll never work again in the business. Correct. Um, but yeah, those two times out of 10, I'm sure they'll look at it and think, you know what? The way this is coming together, we're reassessing our market evaluation. We actually think this movie now could make maybe in this neighborhood, you need a little bit more money. Okay. But the studio is like any business, man. They, if they don't, they don't want to put in one more dollar than they need no, to. No, of course. Just like you, if you're renovating your home, you know what you want. <laughs> yep. You have that picture in your head. You've met with the contractor. The contractor tells you how much it would get to put together your home the way you want it done. And mm -hmm. they say, this will be the budget. And then you're going to tell the contractor comes back to you and say, oh, I need another $10,000 for this. You're going to go, you got to justify to me why we absolutely need to have that because I don't want to spend any more money than I need to spend. And an there's an amazing scene. If you, There's a, a show that just came out on FX. It's called Feud, Betty and Joan. It's about Betty Davis and right. Joan Crawford, yeah. right? And there's an amazing scene in this last episode where uh, the director, played by Alfred Molina, is talking to Jack Warner, played by, played by Stanley Tucci. And he says, you know, we need to reshoot. We can't do this. This looks terrible. And he's like, how much do you want to spend on that, Jack? And Jack goes, nothing. That's coming out of your pocket, Bob. And, <laughs> and that's how a lot of times it works. If the director wants it, the director's got like, crap, I got to pony up 10K. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Jacqueline Washburn, who writes, 
I know we should embrace different opinions when it comes to film. Do you ever think it gets to the point where critics see so many movies, their perspective changes and their opinions aren't relevant to their audience? (laughs) It's a hard line. Being a critic means you give your opinion and convince people to see or not see a film. If they are so out of touch with what is a good movie to the average show, doesn't that make their job redundant? Hope that makes sense. Thanks. And keep bringing on the filthy. Um, Here's this is the funny thing. I just whatever. got asked this same question about TV, so I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. All right, this is my opinion of this. It's funny because it is very rarely in almost any field, other than film, when people talking about film critics, that something like this would come up. Because you would never say that an abundance of experience suddenly makes you unqualified to do something. <laughs> yes. It's like, like, you know, that food critic, he's talked to all the top chefs in the world. Yep. He's read all the best books on it. He's eaten in thousands of different restaurants. Can't trust what now, he thinks about mm-mm, a dish. Mm-mm. Uh, this plumber has done jobs on, you know, uh, on, on the uh, Trump Towers. He's done all the plumbing in multiple cities across the world, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I don't think he would know what he's doing when right. it comes to fig- – like it's only in this area that we think an abundance of experience, knowledge, study, and exposure suddenly makes you unqualified. I, I and That I don't understand. When you say uh, we are not in touch with the average Joe, you guys assume that we are not the average Joe. We are the average Joe. Yeah. I am the average movie-going fan. I want to love the movie just as much as you do, just as much as John does. Same thing goes for TV. And, you know, the 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 critic and the backlash from Iron Fist this past week was, you guys don't know anything. You don't know what's going on. You're just critics. You're so over of the – just oversaturized with television. Yes and no. Listen, I watch a ton of TV. At the end of the day, I know what's good and what I like, and I know what's bad and what I don't like. And so – I've been given this platform. We've been given this platform to talk about our opinions and we do it. You can take it with a grain of salt. But at the end of the day, when we walk into a movie, we walk into a television show, we want to love it. So. Um, yeah. it's And really, here's what it comes down to. This is what it really is. I've talked about this before. At the base of it, there is a radically incorrect misconception out there. Mm-hmm. That is this. All filmmakers, or sorry, all film critics are like one entity like the Borg. You know, <laughs> they all think alike, they whatever. Here's a great example of how wrong that is. Look at the Power Rangers. Mm-hmm. The last time I checked, it might be a little lot higher, might be a little lower. It was hovering around the 50%, maybe like somewhere between 44 to 50, something like that. It, it's hovering around that area, okay? That nebulous area. Uh, if you, I think you're I'm looking, looking up, up right, right now. now. And what does it say right now for, for that uh, when the ads aren't popping up all over the place? Power Rangers. Where is it? Oh, uh, 43%. Okay, so 43. So we're in that area, right? What that means is close to half the critics are saying, this is a good movie worth seeing. Sure. And half the critics are saying, this is not such a great movie. You shouldn't go see it. Mm -hmm. So which one's right? See, this is just a great example of saying that all film critics, we're not cut from the same cloth. Like a tie over at the Boston Globe is a totally different film critic from, say, Mark Ellis. Yeah. And Mark Ellis, who's a totally different film critic from a guy like um, um, uh, uh, Rocky, um, uh, James Rocky. Yes. Uh, okay. James Rocky, who is a, a suit wearing, uh, has one set of sensibilities. Mark Ellis, totally different set of sensibilities. And yet Mark Ellis sees... 500 films a year, yep. seeing all that kind of stuff. Yet every film critic is different from each other. We're all different, unique individuals that have our own personal tastes and whatever in movies. And that's why I love like the Rotten Tomatoes system because I, I do too. it takes thousands of people who are film or who cr- critique films and they're all vastly different from each other. And yet, All those people with vastly different tastes in movies and the types of movies they like, 90% of them, even though they're radically different from each other, like this one movie, or only 12% of them liked whatever movie. That's why I like that system myself personally. The key, though, I've always tell people this, is that I think the best thing to do, yes, I think Rotten Tomato uh, scores are relevant and they're useful and good to take a look at. If you want to get a good gauge of would I potentially like this movie, there's no guarantee because there are Rotten Tomato movies that have like 15% that I like. There are Rotten Tomato movies that are like 87% that I dislike. But that's because all film is subjective. 
But all film critics and everybody who does film criticism are different from each other with different tastes and different points of views and different experiences and all that kind of stuff. The key is finding a couple of film critics that you find you're in tune with and work with them because a Jeremy John's film cri uh, criticism will be very, very different from, from a Chris like Duckman. from a Chris Duckman or from a New York Times. Um, yes, like it's vastly, Variety, vastly Hollywood different. Reporter. Let me put this. Let me just put this at you. Sure. Bad Boys Two gets twenty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Let's Be Cops gets nineteen percent. I love both of those movies, so yeah. I'm part of that nineteen percent of people that gave it a fresh rating. But like that nineteen percent, that still means one out of every five film critics out of the thousands out there liked it. Sure. What I normally find. When people, and I, I'm not saying that Jacqueline, you're doing this, not at all. But I'm, what I'm saying, what I normally find is when people say, uh, critics don't know what they talk about. It. Well, the first thing I want to ask is, well, which critics? Because there's like different ones that have different different opinions. Yep. What I, is really normally at the heart of it is this, is that they're saying, my opinion of movies is right and theirs is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, no, that's that's not it at all uh it's just that there are people who have a different opinion from you and that's the beautiful thing that's about why it's movies. called editorial and subjective but to, to bring it back down to it no i do not believe watching more movies somehow makes you disconnected no. i i haven't found i don't think mark ellis is disconnected from the average film fan i don't think uh jeremy johns is disconnected from the average film fan i don't think you're disconnected we are the average film fans and it, most most film critics are the same and sometimes and to end this, sometimes the environment you go to see a movie in, I went to see the premiere of Pineapple Express and I thought it was the funniest movie ever. I watched it three months later on TV and I was like, did I like this movie? So it's <laughs> a lot of times too. That's Listen, we get jaded sometimes. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, we are your average film critic. So. All right. Last question we'll take today. Uh, interesting one comes from Dovey Goldman who writes, Tintin 2 or Paddington 2, which would you rather see? Oh man, Tintin 2. I love Tintin. I love the first one. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt for me, it's Paddington. Yeah. <laughs> I I like Tintin. I did. Oh, Paddington. Man. I remember John Schnepp and I saw Paddington. Okay. And we were both kind of, well, the, the trailers did not look good no. for Paddington. And when we watched it, we're like, this was wonderful. I want to <laughs> see more of this. That damn little bear. <laughs> And the that dude from Down Nabby. I mean, it's... I hope on the DVD of Paddington 2, it's uh, John Campia, that damn, damn little that bear. damn little bear. <laughs> All right, guys, that'll wrap it up for this weekend's worth of mailbags. Thanks so much for joining us. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Keep you up to date on Movie Talk, Heroes, Jedi Council, the Movie Trivia Schmodown, TV Talk, all types of stuff that we got going on here. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of entertainment. I want to thank, of course, Josh McCuga for joining me. Josh, thank you, John. Find you. Blast. Uh, at Josh McCuga on Twitter and Instagram, Clyde TV talk every Monday here on Collider Video. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. I make a lot of announcements actually on my personal uh, social media. So make sure you're following me there just at John Campia. That'll do it for us guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time. Bye-bye.